So uh, today uh, I'm giving the keynote uh, presentation and thank you for the organizer for uh, offering me this opportunity to share with you my uh, knowledge that I acquired over about three decades of working in uh, with space geodesy from the early days of uh, GPS at the time, now with GNSS. And so what I'll do today is going to talk about a uh, different, uh, oops, uh, Okay, so uh, the, some of the techniques and then the applications as we can see over here. So this presentation, uh, a lot of the information gathered with a lot of my uh, students and colleagues and uh, names are over here. Uh, over the years, uh, we can see over here. So I, I also want to, to thank all of my the student, student postdocs and colleagues that uh, helped me uh, acquire all the knowledge uh, that I'll share today. Uh, so lens subsidence is uh, a phenomena, uh, phenomenon that we all study here. This is the, the, the meeting for uh, that. And there are many uh, processes that uh, cause that. Uh, here we see some uh, of the uh, uh, processes, and I'll talk more about it toward the end of the presentation. Now, when uh, we have something to refer it to, like in this case, uh, we have some structures that allow us to do that in uh, Agua Calientes or in Celaya, Mexico City. Uh, it's easy to, to see that it exists and to measure that uh, because the reference for that. When things are a little bit, we don't have this reference point, it's a little bit more difficult and then we need all of these uh, scientific tools that uh, uh, we uh, develop over the year. What? So uh, the presentation content uh, will divide it into uh, two. First is the measurements, uh, the measurement uh, that uh, use first the terrestrial measurements and then space geodetic measurements. Uh, we'll go briefly through the terrestrial. Uh, the main uh, focus would be on uh, GNSS uh, and mostly about INSA. And then applications uh, will be according to the temporal and spatial scale. Uh, see how it, uh, things are working. So the terrestrial uh, methods uh, listed just uh, four of them. Uh, here are the most traditional uh, the, uh, precise leveling that uh, basically we measure. It's a very traditional, been used for uh, more than a century. Uh, the impo it improved over time, but basically we just measure from one place to another and we have a multiple point of measurement and local networks and it works very well. And, as we see, it's still uh, being used. Uh, another method, which is point measurements, uh, which is a, a borehole extentometer, and you can see an example over here, that we can get the information about what happens in the subsurface uh, using 1D uh, change in the thickness of uh, layers. Uh, two other point uh, measurement techniques are the road surface uh, a elevation table or R set uh, that allow us to measure the changes of the surface itself. It's used mainly in wetland uh, sediments. Uh, again, it with uh, respect to some kind of a, a anchoring to a depth, uh, so we can see how the surface is changing with respect not about what happens in the subsurface. And a more a, 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 a more a recent techniques, a more advanced technique, which is a fiber optics that again measures things in the subsurface and allow us to see how things changing uh, in different uh, location in the subsurface. So uh, these are in brief about these uh, terrestrial techniques. Uh, more uh, we use uh, the space geodesies, uh, space geodesy, the uh, sets of uh, technologies uh, that allow us to study Geodesy, which is one of the ancient uh, or the earliest scientists, is a study of the Earth's size, shape, orientation, and gravitational field, and these changes over time. And since the beginning of the ge uh, space geodesy revolution in the 1980s, uh, even before 70s, there is a whole set of uh, techniques, technologies that were developed. Uh, we can see over here. And uh, we are, are going to focus on two of them. It's uh, the GNSS, used to be GPS, and now it's GNSS, and uh, remote sensing, or the INSA that we see over here. The uh, GNSS, it's an umbrella term for including all satellite navigation techniques. 
uh, we started with GPS global positioning systems, which is the uh, the U.S. Uh, American uh, system what first developed, and then uh, the Russian or the Soviet developed the GLONASS. Then uh, we have other the Galileo the European, the Chinese uh, Baidu, and uh, then we have also regional uh, system, the Indian the Nav Navic and the Japanese QZSS, which I don't know how to pronounce it. And uh, so we can see that uh, we have a whole uh, range of satellites that are uh, being used. Uh, in our cell phones, we use a variety of these satellites. Uh, in the precise measurement, uh, our uh, community still very much sticks to GPS. Uh, so how does it work? We have uh, these sets of satellites that uh, orbit the Earth at uh, different uh, most of them, the GPS is at uh, 20,000 uh, kilometer above the Earth's surface, and they provide signals, and they, they were plans for navigation, so we get what is called the navigation solution, basically take the range or the distance from the satellite uh, to the surface and uh, triangulate them, and we can get the accuracy of about 5 to 10 meters. Uh, then we have the uh, more accurate is differential GPS that we have a correct reference station that send uh, a signals, uh, corrections to the uh, a navigation solution, and we can get to about order of about uh, one meter. And then we have double difference that uh, takes care of a lot of, uh, uh, of the noise that they have in uh, between uh, in the range measurement uh, because we can uh, differentiate some of these and we get to about one to three centimeters. Now, uh, there are two uh, main methods about collecting uh, data for precise measurements. Uh, one is the episodic, as we can see over here. Uh, so we have the episodic, uh, we take the instrument, put it uh, over a benchmark, and then uh, take it away and return at some other uh, time, point in time. And uh, this is in the beginning when it was very expensive, uh, so that's how it's been used. It's uh, cheaper, it's safe, uh, we don't lose equipment. Uh, it uh, provides linear rate mainly because uh, we don't have enough uh, temporal resolution. Uh, so there's a disadvantage that uh, we have low temporal resolution and uh, human uh, error because when we put it over the benchmark, we need to take measurement and usually this is some of the things that uh, we can accumulate and we need to send people a crew to take the measurement. The continuously operating uh, uh, GPS, as we can see over here in the, the image, like the station we have uh, set up in uh, Miami where we study coastal subsidence. So uh, the single deployment is expensive, but uh, we don't need to send people to get the data. It's uh, automatically uh, we receive that. Uh, it has high temporal resolution. And so we can actually detect also, besides the linear rate, we can see also seasonal and other uh, transient uh, deformation. Uh, the uncertainties for linear rate is about, it depends uh, how many uh, acquisitions we take or what, uh, how many episodes uh, or campaign we take. Uh, but usually if we have enough uh, or long enough time series, it's about one millimeter per year. And uh, here we can get uh, below one millimeter per year, especially if we model it with the, uh, also the seasonal uh, impact on that. Uh, now we can have GNSS networks. Uh, so the, the GNSS, before we go to the network, provide accurate 3D uh, point measurements. Uh, the changes, but what measure is the changes of the antenna with time? It's not the surface, but it's the monument itself. And uh, it's a, what is very important is with respect to a external uh, a reference frame it's not locally, it's usually we do the ITRF, uh, International Terrestrial Reference Frame, it's with respect to the center of the Earth. Uh, now, GNS uh, work, uh, networks, uh, they use the same external reference, all this, and uh, so although we have point measurement, we can look, because they all share the same reference frame, uh, we have a, uh, we can get signal of uh, long wavelengths, uh, they can be uh, typically, the stations are located about 10 kilometers apart or even more, like you see here in California. Uh, but uh, we have a very, we can see over very wide distances. And uh, the uh, disadvantage is that uh, we have low spatial resolution. 
Uh, now, what do we measure? This is uh, one of the things. Uh, so if we have the stations uh, that are said it's the, uh, the monument movement, so if it's shallow anchored, we can measure the uh, shallow movement of the, uh, the monument, or if it's deep anchored, is the deeper part. If it's on a building, we measure the movement of the building. So it's not the surface itself, but it's where it's anchored. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have to, uh, if we're interested in the shallow subsidence, I think it's possible that it take care of the upper five meters. So uh, we have to, to, to check what is, how deep uh, the monument is anchored. And uh, this study by Keo and Toskit, uh, they reported that in Louisiana, where the study is the subsidence of the uh, Mississippi Delta, uh, most of the, of the average uh, uh, anchoring depths of the GNSS stations is 21.5 meter below the land surface. Uh, so these don't provide a good measure for these shallow processes. Uh, we need to, to go into uh, actually a shallow anchored. So when I designed the network for coastal subsidence in uh, Miami and the area, uh, we designed it with shallow uh, anchoring, well, let's say about one meter, even less than one meter. So it depends what you want to measure. That's the way it should be designed. Uh, so the strengths of uh, GNSS, uh, high temporal resolution, 3D uh, observations, uh, external uh, reference frame. Uh, it, if we have a GNSS uh, network, we can get really long wavelength deformation. And the, uh, we have already longer uh, observation span of uh, 25 to 30 years. So we, we can have really long time series. Uh, the weakness is that it's a low spatial resolution. It's limited ability to, show, to solve short wavelengths. And um, we have a, one of the issues is a vertical is not as a accurate, although we can uh, get because the vertical, there is a lot of other processes that affect the vertical, like a, a, the stroposphere. And uh, a, we have also in, like hydrology is one of the things that affects the vertical uh, deformation. Uh, so also what we measure, we have to take in part that we measure the monument uh, movement and not the surface movement. Now uh, let's move on to the uh, INSA, it's Informatic Synthetic Amperture Radar. And here I was uh, debating to what depths we have to cover it because we have the expert in the field here and we, we have people who know very little about it. So we need to find a common uh, ground to explain uh, the basic thing. So Basically, uh, the characteristic of the system is that it's, uh, a, it's a microwave uh, a signal, a active transmitted signal, receive it back. Uh, it uses, most of them use a single wavelengths, uh, and uh, we can have different polarizations. So we have four bands of them, and uh, we have two observable. One is the amplitude, and the other is the phase, and I'll explain in a little bit. And it's an active sensor, works day and night, and in all weather conditions. Uh, so what I'm going to cover over here is basically INSA basics, uh, the signal, the sa sa satellite, acquisition geometry, uh, interferogram generation, uh, unwrapping, and then uh, I'm going to focus more about the, the limitation, what are the, uh, the main error sources, uh, the correlation, unwrapping, tropospheric delay, and how we can get from there the uncertainties. And then we'll go to INSA time series analysis, uh, why we use that, the main methods, uh, the product, which are typically the velocity maps. And again, look at the main uh, error sources and uh, estimate the uncertainties. Uh, so this is the, the SAR signal is uh, actually complex uh, raw data, uh, which decompose into the, uh, the amplitude and the phase. As we can see over here in the amplitude is a, it's like an image in black and white, uh, it, it, but it's a different uh, image than the vis the, what we see, the visual image, uh, the visual, because we use different wavelengths. The phase look uh, very much like random, but it's a pseudo-random because uh, we can actually uh, compare it with another ob observation from the same uh, area and get something out of it. Now, uh, we have already 
uh, three decades of uh, observations, and actually four if we take into account there was the first uh, SAR satellite was the CSAT in 1979, but uh, it operated only for three uh, months. But uh, from these, uh, we have uh, three bands that have been used uh, for observation so far for civilian satellites. Uh, and we can see here the band that we call it actually frequency band. Uh, it in gigahertz, we can see from uh, 0 0.3 to 1, this is the P band. Uh, so far, there is no uh, satellite, uh, but I think ESA is uh, in planning of uh, launching a P band satellite, which is very good for vegetation. And then we have the L band, S band, it's supposed to be part of the uh, NISA, which is the NASA and ISRO. Uh, the Indian Space Agency. Then we have C-band and X-band. We can see that many C-bands, mainly thanks to the uh, European Space Agency and uh, the Canadian Space Agency. We have a lot of C-band satellites and continuity. Uh, this is very important. Uh, with L-band, we have uh, from the uh, JAXA, the, the Japanese Space Agency. They are uh, the ones that provide us. And uh, the upcoming NISA, which hopefully will be launched uh, this year, uh, also going to be with uh, L-band and S-band. And uh, why is it important? We have the X-band, which is uh, shorter, and uh, these are the German and the Italian space agencies, and uh, also the Taiwanese. Uh, why is it important? Uh, the wavelengths we'll see, uh, because it uh, also provides us uh, the detection uh, sensitivity is about 10% of the signal wavelength, so a uh, short wavelengths like X band provide a high uh, uh, ability to detect uh, shorter wavelengths uh, uh, signal changes, whereas, uh, but it's also very sensitive to vegetation. Uh, the, the longer wavelengths, uh, L band uh, has a lower sensitivity but works well when it's vegetated area. So just uh, one example of a satellite, uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, A and B, this is the, the ESA operated. Uh, it's actually a constellation of two satellites. Uh, the first one, uh, Sentinel-1A, uh, was launched uh, in uh, 2014, uh, B in 20, actually 16, not 15, uh, and it uh, stopped operation after uh, five years, and uh, ESA planned to uh, launch the uh, 1C pretty soon, so we'll have again a constellation of two satellites. Uh, it has a width of 250 kilometer and higher temporal resolution of uh, 2 to 12 uh, uh, days, and it's also very, uh, very important. It has a consistent uh, acquisition plan, so we can uh, generate interferometry. Uh, so the acquisition, uh, we have different acquisition modes. Uh, strip map is that the satellite acquired data as it moves, uh, so it's a one for one. Then we have a SCANSA that it can uh, acquire over multiple, a uh, much wider area, multiple time, but low resolution. And uh, we have the uh, spot, uh, uh, spotlight uh, that it's a, it can, a, oops, uh, it tracks over in a certain area longer period of time and get a higher resolution. And then we have the uh, the tops, which is the opposite of uh, stop, which is more like a scanner that it uh, measures uh, faster than the way it uh, the satellite moves, so it can go over three uh, swaps. And uh, we can see here this is an example of the uh, Sentinel uh, that everybody today everybody uses the uh, Sentinel. It's available. It's free. So uh, we have a different acquisition, different geometries. So I think most people are familiar with uh, Sentinels that's been yeah, used now. It, data is free, uh, and uh, it's uh, been used, a very successful satellite uh, or constellation. Uh, but we have other satellites, uh, and the spatial resolution uh, depends. We have uh, with TerraSAR-X, it can go to submeter with the high-resolution spotlight. Uh, so there's a trade-off where the swath uh, width is smaller when we have a very high resolution or we have a very wide uh, swath uh, and the spatial resolution of the uh, individual pixel is uh, uh, larger. Uh, so how we generate uh, interferogram, we basically, we in, in, it's a phase information and uh, we uh, do interferogram, we subtract one for another and it looks pseudo-random, but actually we can get 
a lot of information out of that. We get this is some phase information. And uh, the, what is important that the information is in line of sight. It's not, it's not in nadir, it's uh, slanted. And there is a lot goes into that, but it's not three dimensional, it's one dimensional. And there are different contributions. So what we get, the, uh, the phase changes that we observe over here as multiple sources, where it's topography, orbits, troposphere, ionosphere. We usually after the displacement, uh, especially for land subsidence, uh, so we have to take that into account. Uh, so we try to uh, remove all of the other phase sources and we also uh, remain with the noise. Uh, so if we have uh, interferogram, uh, we can see the, the phase changes. If we go along this uh, uh, transect, we can see this is the phase that what we call wrapped it between zero and two pi, but uh, it's just wrapped over there. So we need to unwrap it and we can get in this case uh, up to eight pi. So this is more, uh, we, we, uh, we after the signals, which is unwrapped, but it's, uh, this process is uh, something we have to uh, explore because it's one of the main error sources. So we then we convert it to lengths by which is a proportion to the, uh, sig the signal wavelengths. So uh, INSAR uh, interferograms are not perfect. Uh, we always have some kind of noise. Uh, here is just an example of the interferogram over South Florida, where we study actually not the, we study lab subsidence, but in this case, we study uh, water level changes in wetlands. So what we see over here, we see different type of uh, fringes. We see some systematic fringes, in this case, representative of water level changes. But uh, we see places where we don't have signal, we don't see any uh, fringes, it's inco we call it incoherence. Uh, then we have a uh, short wavelengths over here uh, that we can say this is, doesn't represent water level changes, doesn't represent surface deformation, so we attribute it to tropospheric delay. And then uh, we have also here, this is urban area, uh, we have long wavelengths here, and uh, we also don't expect to have deformation over here, so this is also attributed to the uh, uh, atmospheric delay. So uh, the main uh, error sources are the correlation, as we can see over here, or the incoherence, uh, tropospheric delay and unwrapping uh, that uh, we'll see. So the measure for the coherence is, uh, uh, we, we actually do uh, a, an operator uh, product, uh, product of two uh, phase uh, from two is acquisitions and we calculate the coherence over here. And it uh, actually, the model for coherence uh, have a lot of uh, component into that, which uh, the thermal uh, coherence, uh, temporal coherence, uh, Doppler volume, geometric. And uh, so this is uh, something that uh, we have studied in different environment and a lot of other people studied. And uh, so what they actually contribute to decorrelation so the land cover, whether in arid area, urban area, or vegetated area, is if there is any land cover change, earthquake, agriculture that change the surface, so we, we lose coherence. Uh, then we have uh, the length, uh, the signal wavelengths, the temporal baseline is important, the geometric baselines, all of that. Now, uh, the signal and uh, wavelengths and vegetation, uh, we can see that uh, when we have short wavelength signal, uh, it doesn't penetrate the the vegetation, it stays uh, actually it, uh, returned from the uh, surface. As the signal wavelength increases, it can go uh, and penetrate into deeper depths. Uh, L band can uh, sense this. the surface. P band is uh, very good of uh, observing uh, uh, the, uh, the surface also. Uh, this is an example where we study different vegetation type uh, using different parameters, and this is. Uh, the uh, over here we have the perpendicular baseline and here the temporal baseline and basically uh, we can see that the uh, higher uh, coherence occurs when we have a shorter perpendicular baseline and uh, shorter temporal baseline as we can see over here so this is uh, the effect of uh, vegetation on the correlation uh, then we have tropospheric delay uh, basically uh, the uh, the satellite signal actually uh, sample a big part. Uh, it's from uh, a elevation of five to 800 kilometers. Uh, so uh, it sample uh, the atmosphere 
Uh, we have the ionosphere over here and the troposphere over here, but most of the changes occur in the troposphere. And the two main uh, uh, processes that actually affect that, uh, we have the, uh, what's called the vertical certification that it's uh, correlated with the topography. And uh, so uh, we can have a troposphere in uh, time one like this and time like two will be over here. And if we differentiate between the two of them, we'll have a signal that it's proportional to the, uh, or correlated with the topography. And they have uh, the, uh, the turbulence uh, mixing, which is not correlated with topography and uh, a lot of work done by uh, Ramon Hansen and its model uh, as a power law. And this is just an example of a power law that uh, we used in one of our studies. And so uh, here uh, we used this, we simulated the topospheric delay uh, over a study uh, area in New Mexico. We tried to see why we don't see a uplift uh, over there due to, uh, of, uh, it's called Sakura Magma Body. And this is in this simulation, we use the vertical certification and uh, we see as a larger uh, a contribution is from the tu uh, turbulence mixing. And when we add a, a, both of them, we can get uh, a signal. Oh, actually, it's a noise, but it's a topospheric delay signal in that case. Uh, in this case, it's plus minus uh, four centimeters. But when we have in the tropics, uh, we have a situation that we can go up to 20 centimeters, especially if the, like a hurricane is going through. And, uh, we have situation with a lot of uh, tropospheric delay. Uh, so uh, the last uh, uh, error is the uh, unwrapping error. Uh, the main error, because there are many uh, there are small other errors, that, uh, but we need to, take, to be aware of this unwrapping. So there are many algorithms for uh, uh, looking at uh, to unwrap an interferogram. Uh, so, uh, a lot of them work well when we have a coherent phase. What happens when the, the phase is not coherent? Uh, th this is where the, uh, this algorithm fail. And here, this is example from the study of uh, U et al. That uh, look at this interferogram and compare it with uh, a observation uh, from uh, a altimetry track. And we can see that there is uh, when uh, the uh, the phase is the coherent, we have good results, but when it's incoherent, we have a lot of uh, deviation. So this is something we have to be aware that uh, unwrapping uh, depends on the quality of the interferogram. So if we look at the uh, uncertainties, uh, we, we have, uh, we have in the coherence or incoherence, uh, what affects that is the signal wavelengths, the length cover, temporal baseline, perpendicular baseline, at the spatial resolution and the uh, fringe saturation. Uh, we have uh, also unwrapping errors and tropospheric delay. So uh, the issue, if we have a, a slow deformation, we have the major contribution for that. It depends on the coherence, but also on the tropospheric delay. And I brought this example. Uh, this is, uh, it's not the subsidence. It's, uh, there was an earthquake in this area in, in Spain. Uh, I, I used this paper and I said, it, this is uh, what they, they say, this is the signal over here, but if you look at the observation, there's a lot of tropospheric noise over here. So it's not that uh, obvious that we can actually uh, detect the signal that they want to see. It's, for example, in this uh, the descending, uh, uh, we can see this is the signal they're looking, but you can see that the tropospheric uh, uh, delay is much uh, larger than that. So we have to be aware of the uh, tropospheric delay that the signal uh, should be much larger than the noise or significantly larger than the noise in order to uh, get uh, information out of it. Now, uh, we said in, in fast deformation, we can have sit situation of saturation of fringes. Uh, this is from our studies of uh, Mexico City. You can see when we have a short Temporal baseline, we can uh, resolve better the, uh, uh, the situation than when we have long temporal baseline because we have saturation of uh, fringes. So that's two opposite cases. Uh, from, here, from here, we uh, move to INSA time series. Uh, basically, we, have a, a, we want to go information from individual uh, a, a interferogram to, to see how things are changing over time. 
And uh, so we, we look at the stack of interferogram and we want to get uh, to see what happens. And we, the characteristic product is the velocity map. And we can see here these two examples. One, uh, we have a, we see a good, would say, what good uh, interferogram because we, uh, or velocity map, because we observe what we expected to see. It's uplift of a Sokoa magma body. The other one, the lower one, is not so good because we see a lot of noise. So what, why is it, uh, in one case we can get a good result, in another case not. And uh, part of the thing is that the length of the time series, you can see here we have 15 years, here we have only five years. Uh, so this is one thing that uh, we have studied. Uh, so there are different uh, ways, methods of uh, going from uh, uh, the, the Interferogram, individual interferogram to a time series, and uh, the way we do it is by we call it the network. How we tie which interferogram we form because we have many possibilities. So the persistent scatter interferometry is using a, a, a primary once it is called to be master, but now it's called primary, the politically correct. And uh, when we have the sh a small baseline subset analysis, we use a network with uh, multiple. A primaries and secondaries. Uh, so here, over here we have stronger uh, persistent scatterer as we see over here. So we have a, a PS, a, they are stronger, and over here we use a distributed uh, scatterers. And uh, we can have many subsets uh, of, uh, like in uh, SBUS, we use uh, different uh, networks. This is a study by MIN. I show an uh, example of short special temporal baseline versus uh, fully connected, and they have different results. And nowadays, a lot of people use methods of uh, MinPy, which use a lot of short uh, temporal because it, a lot of uh, high, we have high uh, coherence over here. Uh, but this is also uh, introduces some noise, and I'm not sure if it's been uh, the uh, Uncertainty analysis for this type of uh, network uh, was properly studied. Uh, and then we have hybrid technique, uh, SQUISA, that uh, Alexander Ferretti developed and uh, uses a combination of both uh, distributed and uh, persistent uh, scatterer. Uh, so uh, in uh, this study uh, by Osman and et al., we actually compared the different techniques. This is a study where we use data for Mexico City uh, for a period of eight years. Uh, we can see here a uh, velocity map by the four techniques, PSI, SBUS, STAMPS, and SQUISA. And uh, we see similar uh, velocity map because the deformation there is very high. Everybody, all of the methods uh, pick up about 250 to 300 millimeter per year. Uh, however, we see some differences uh, between uh, the method. This is the residual velocities. Uh, we see similarities between SQUISAR and SBUS. Uh, STAMPS is uh, uh, different uh, when especially we see PSI and STAMPS. Uh, but uh, basically, is, uh, we can say which one is better because each method has uh, uh, different uh, advantages and disadvantages. And we cannot just uh, say this is better because we get better results over here because it depends on the application. So that's something that uh, we need to take into consideration, we can work with a different method, but we don't get the same results. Uh, so uh, we have uh, in, uh, the main errors in time series uh, is we have the issue the same as in interferogram because error propagates. When we do the time series, we have we basically propagate the errors. Uh, so the, uh, this is a study we did uh, with Alessandro uh, 10 years ago about Venice subsidence. And uh, we can see over here that the uncertainty is actually increased as we go away from the reference point. And uh, we can see the study of uh, Vasily uh, that we did, we see the same thing, that the, uh, the uncertainty increase as we go from the reference point. And the reason is uh, there is an increase in in unwrapping, uh, you can have unwrapping errors and uh, change of uh, topospheric delay as we move uh, away from the reference point. So this is uh, one thing that uh, we need to 
uh, take into account. And then how the effect of uh, another thing that we studied in is that uh, the effect of the time series and acquisition span. We did some simulation, uh, the stratify turbulent and the combine of them. Uh, so this is just an example of one time series analysis and we did like 10,000 10, of them and we calculated uh, what will be the, uh, <clears throat> the errors for mean error for the, this uh, scene over here. And <clears throat> we can see that uh, for each uh, time, uh, we can see that the different uh, experiments we did uh, from six days uh, to 105 days. Here is uh, with Sentinel LS2 uh, and NISA, NISA, we can see over here. And the shorter the uh, acquisition span, we get lower uncertainty. And also uh, when uh, we have longer time series, we get uh, lower uncertainties. So uh, when if we're interested to detect things at two millimeter per year, we, we need uh, and we want a full six days of uh, Sentinel-1. We need five years of uh, a time series to, to reach the level of two millimeter per year. Uh, if we use 12 days, we need uh, six years. And uh, with uh, NISA, we will need uh, also six to seven years. If we want to reach the level of uh, one millimeter per year, we actually we need a longer time series of uh, seven, seven years in case of the Sentinel-1. But in this study, we didn't take into account one thing that uh, people are doing now routinely, which is the uh, atmospheric uh, correction. Uh, so there are different uh, ways of improving the uh, signal to noise in, uh, in using the, trying to model out the tropospheric effect. Uh, there are different way of doing it, whether using uh, the tropospheric delay from GNSS, uh, using spectrometer satellites, Maris and MODIS, uh, numerical weather models, and uh, fusion of GPS measurements. Uh, so we can see some results comparing the different results. So basically, uh, these uh, things, uh, they uh, improve the this, this signal to, to noise, uh, mostly in the, uh, the long wavelength. Uh, it, it's not helping so much in the very short wavelengths, but in the long wavelengths, it does definitely improve. Uh, basically, uh, for INSA, uh, we see that high spatial resolution, ability to solve uh, short wavelengths, uh, high sensitivity to vertical movement, uh, long observation span from multiple satellite systems, 25 years, and uh, good uh, uh, monitoring of urban area, uh, not so good in a uh, rural area. So let's uh, go quickly to the next, is that when we look about the, which method to use when we look at different uh, uh, lens subsidence. Uh, uh, openness. So this, uh, you're probably familiar with these uh, uh, curves, uh, these graphs of uh, temporal versus uh, spatial scales. And this, uh, I listed here, uh, some of the, the main uh, processes that cause lens subsidence. So let's say the, the long uh, GIA, geological uh, uh, isostatic uh, adjustment, it uh, happens over long, uh, this is, I'll explain in a little bit, over uh, long uh, time periods and uh, over long distances, so it will be over here. Another example is the uh, sinkholes and landslide, which occurs pretty fast and over a shorter time scale. And uh, we have fluid extractions, uh, which is intermediate, and all the other, you can see they fall in different uh, locations. Uh, now, when we look at the uh, space geodetic uh, measurement techniques, uh, we have the GNSS, uh, which is a point measurement, but maybe an area because we have the monument over some distance, uh, so maybe up to uh, a few meters. And then we have, on the other side, we have the GNSS networks that uh, it depends how much is the station of the part. So we have the two extreme, either very small or very wide area. And in between, we have complementary of the uh, INSA. We have a standard resolution, which goes to 250 uh, kilometers, and the high resolution, uh, which is, uh, is from uh, meter or submeters to maybe 25 or some kilometers. Uh, so if we combine, okay, maybe I'm not looking, it's going to work. <laughs> no. 
Okay, let's uh, try the. So maybe it's not this is a problem. Okay. Okay. There was something that popped out over there. No, it's okay. Uh, so, so when we put the two of them together, it's very it's it's a mixture. But basically, we can see which one uh, helps one another. So let's go uh, and look at the the different quickly because I don't have much time. But uh, so we have here the uh, GIA, oops, uh, which I, I said it's a, the glacial acetatic adjustment. And basically, it's what happens. Uh, it's a remnant of uh, the mental response to the changes in the load due to the ice. So when during the ice ages, there was a weight in the polar region uh, that suppresses the crust down, move the mantle sideways when the ice melted. There is a movement back. And uh, we can see over here uh, that uh, this is study from Celite Al that it, we have uplift over here, but in the peripheral budge, we have the opposite effect, the subsidence uh, over here, which uh, contribute to sea level rise we get over here. So in this case, which is a long wavelength, uh, we need GPS networks. Uh, then uh, tectonics, uh, we have uh, it's typically three-dimensional. Uh, the length scale is usually large because it's a deeper part of the Earth. In geophysics, we say the deeper the signal, the longer the wavelength. So here it's deeper. Uh, we have a 10 kilometer and more. Sometimes it's less, but typically. Uh, and uh, we have different uh, uh, processes. Uh, we have very short uh, temporal uh, time scale. We have post seismic deformation, volcanic eruptions. Then we have intermediate uh, post seismic deformation. And uh, we have slow, which is the inter seismic uh, or inter-eruption. We can see here when we have, uh, like in subduction zone, we'll, we'll have uh, uplift and subsidence. Uh, it depends. Uh, we can uplift in the inter-seismic and subsidence during the, the earthquake or vice versa. Uh, this is an interesting study that uh, where we study uh, post-seismic deformation following the Haiti earthquake. We saw some subsidence, but this is because uh, there was uplift of the, the land by uh, half a meter and groundwater were flowing out, and it caused subsidence over there, so it's a complex signal, or when we have volcanic eruptions, and afterward there's a cooling down, we have a subsidence. A sediment compaction is a sediment uh, a response to the weight of the columns, and uh, again, the uh, length scale is pretty wide. This is like a, it's a delta, it's a wide area. A time scale is also long, but we have rates of one to 10 millimeter per year. In this case, uh, GNSS and uh, INSA may work. Uh, it depends on the environment. In the, one of the best studied area is the Mississippi Delta, and we get uh, a, the GNSS provide good information. And the INSA doesn't because we have a lot of vegetation and water, so we measure actually water level changes rather than subsidence over there. And uh, fiber optics, if we're interested in the, uh, or excitometers, and the shallow subsidence. Uh, now, surface loading, uh, which is, uh, loading can be different type of loading, but usually when we say it, we talk about hydrological loading. So if we have, a, it's like the ice, but uh, a smaller amount, so it doesn't affect the mantle. It's something that we, it's an elastic response. We put a, a load, then remove it. So uh, it's mostly elastic. There is some, maybe possibly some viscoelastic, but usually we just talk about the elastic. and. Example uh, we, we study over here is the, the Dead Sea uh, in uh, Israel and Jordan over here uh, is losing uh, water in a rate of about one meter per year, and that caused a uplift of the area uh, along the margins and even wider. We can see the INSA is over here. Uh, so this is that example. Fluid ec extraction, something that uh, discussed a lot in this uh, meeting. Uh, again, we have a two types of deformation, the poor elastic, which is a coral and the compaction, the permanent deformation. Uh, again, it's deeper, it's about uh, one, two uh, kilometer beneath the surface. Uh, the time scale, we see some seasonality, so it's less than a year. 
and the uh, rate can vary from one millimeter to 400 that's we see in Mexico City. Uh, and uh, the both the method work pretty well. Uh, integration of both methods is uh, probably most likely to work best. Uh, sinkholes and landslides these are short, uh, very short uh, wavelengths. Uh, we have a length scale of a kilometer, less than kilometer or something. Landslide can be maybe a little bit more. Uh, here, example of rates, uh, when we, we talk about the limestone uh, cavities in limestone, uh, that we have cavity in subsurface, uh, this is a very slow rate. Uh, we studied it in, uh, in Florida. Uh, we can see uh, some subsidence, uh, usually of buildings over there because it's a vegetated environment. But when we have uh, sinkholes in uh, salt rock, uh, this can be very high rates of uh, uh, centimeters per day. Uh, this example in the Dead Sea in the fairground, we can see uh, four centimeters between uh, 10 days and like that. Uh, and then uh, we have soil consolidation. Uh, subsidence occur because the soil uh, changes volume gradually in response to changes in pressure. There are two types of uh, uh, sub uh, consolidation. We, see, we call it the primary consolidation, secondary con consolidation. And the length scale is something that it occurs very shallow, uh, very close to the surface at the upper, depending how thick is the soil layer. But uh, we talk about a few uh, upper, maybe 10 meters. So the, the length scales can be from very, uh, for building size to uh, city size, but it's usually very, it's a localized subsidence signal. And uh, the time scale, it uh, depends on the, the process itself. It can be, we have high rate in the beginning and slow rate afterwards. Uh, and this is just an example uh, that we studied in Miami Beach and the uh, data from uh, in the 90s. And we detected the localized subsidence over here where uh, we didn't expect that. And that the building that collapsed in uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, the Southside building. So it was a, in the data we were able to pick it up. Uh, so uh, I think my time is up. So just a summary, we, uh, what I presented here is the different um, measurement techniques. Uh, we have the uh, terrestrial measurements, uh, leveling, borehole, uh, and fiber optics. And uh, then we have the space geodetic techniques. And we have a advantages and disadvantages or weaknesses and strengths for each of the method. And the way of uh, doing that is actually, as uh, suggested uh, yesterday or two days ago, by Alessandro, uh, the integration of these two techniques to actually uh, bring more strengths to the, our measurements. And uh, we can see that uh, we can apply and use the techniques for each studying uh, different phenomena, uh, each it depends on the time scale and the uh, length scale of the phenomena, which uh, method we're going to use. And, uh, and we also talked about the uncertainties. So this is something that's also important uh, here. So thank you. And I just want to acknowledge the different uh, agencies that uh, provided funding through the years, the space agencies that provided the, the data, and UNAFCA that helped with different parts of this uh, work. Thank you. Okay, thanks to Shimon for this very nice presentation about the, the techniques and the measurements, uh, applications to measure land subsidence, but not only land subsidence, a lot of others. Uh, so now we can take some questions. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, real nice presentation. Um, you were talking about peat oxidation and then the temporal resolution of one day. But oxidation is in fact a very slow process. So do you mean maybe the, the shrinkage and swell of, the, of peat soils? And in that case, it would also apply for clay soils. Yeah. Uh, oxidation, uh, I didn't show the example over here. Uh, Okay, uh, where did I put that? Oxidation, we can see that, uh, yeah, uh, maybe it's a, I underestimated it should be higher here, over here. 
Now the thing is that uh, we can is the sometimes the process is very slow. You're, you're right. So the rate is what counts, uh, and also the, it can be very localized and can be much wider. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, using these two techniques is uh, can be a problem because also we measure the surface. And as I said with GNSS, we measure not just the surface itself. We measure what happens depend how deep uh, it's uh, been. And I saw the, the studies that uh, uh, put, put, uh, here at Delft that they uh, trying to use a transponder to see how the surface respond to uh, changes in elevation. Maybe that's the right way to do it. So the, again, uh, it's a very slow process. It should be, uh, I uh, agree with you that it should be higher over here. We cannot see it in days. We can look at it in years time scale. So it should yeah. be changed. Thank you. Yeah. But, I, but I think that shrinkage and swell and maybe also freezing of and thawing of soils will have indeed uh, a one-day resolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we need to, ex to expand, not just... Uh, we have a lot of deformation processes, and uh, we have to include that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for this uh, nice presentations with a lot of uh, interesting uh, examples. Uh, a lot of uh, cases you showed uh, uh, can be regarded a little bit as uh, forensic uh, geodetic engineering. So what happened, uh, who's responsible, which process, etc. Uh, uh, for instance, the sinkhole formation or the building movement in the 90s, etc. Uh, do you also uh, are planning or do you also apply the techniques to do some sort of predictive modeling? Where will a sinkhole occur? Uh, which building will collapse, uh, or with probabilities, of course. So more of a, a forward view instead of a more of a forensic view. Okay, uh, this is very good. We're usually very good in uh, retrospect uh, in uh, most of our studies when we know what is the answer. Uh, yeah, we, we, we would like to use the, these techniques as forensic and to uh, actually to flag situation where we, we see uh, a building or an infrastructure that it's actually under situation uh, we see that there's movement like we have a study of uh, the metro system in Mexico City uh, we, we like to do it the question what do you do with that because there is also who with whom do you share the data it's it become uh, not just the science itself it becomes how what you do with the data uh, who, with whom do you share it and who takes responsibility about that uh, so uh, it's, it's beyond just, like when we had the, the issue of the building collapse, people asked me, did you inform anybody? So I informed, it was a study about a, a coastal subsidence. So I informed the agency that cares about coastal subsidence and inform about the building because I, I can go to the building and say, I, I see your building is subsiding. So I, it's, it's not subsiding, it subsided 20 years ago. And they would say, uh, so, so what? Uh, so it's, uh, it depends what you do with the information, with whom do you share it, and who takes responsibility. So uh, it's beyond just the, the science itself. We need to work with the, with the stakeholders, which are the citizens, the, the different agencies, uh, at municipal level maybe, but it's, it's a bigger question than how to, how to share the information. Yeah, uh, interesting, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So we take one last question. Okay. Hi, Shimon. In one of your slides, you show the uncertainty of subsidence rate divided from your time series. So you show that how many years you can reach one or two millimeters per year. Can you show that slide? Yes, this one. So can you briefly explain how did you calculate this or estimate this? How, how did we derive that? Yeah. OK, so we. Uh... We, we did, uh, I showed when we looked at the troposphere, we did the simulation of the, the, uh, the stratified uh, for this area. Uh, the, the stratified, uh, which is depending on the, uh, the topography. And then we did uh, a different simulation for the turbulent using the, the power law uh, equation with different parameters we changed. And then we, we did time series by calculating uh, many interferograms depends how many, let's say we did a uh, 10 years time series with uh, six days. So we have six, uh, uh, 50 interferograms per year. So we have about 
500 interferograms that we calculated uh, what is the change. Uh, and we calculated this point over, this is for one point, and then we did 10,000 uh, simulations, and we, we did, because it's not, it depends on the parameter, we get this point here for six days uh, and uh, 10 years. So uh, we had many time series, and uh, many interferograms, and many time series to, to get, to calculate this point, and we did all the other points, and then we connect the, the dots. And we get this, and uh, so uh, it's the best. You can see that it doesn't fall on the line. This is the line that was the best fit. Uh, I think we, we use here logarithmic uh, fit uh, to connect the lot. Did you compare with the decay compare? Uh, 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 we, we started uh, this study because we went, we studied the Sokoma magma body and we used five years of uh, NVSAT data and we didn't get the signal, we got noise. And when we looked at ERS with uh, 12 years data, we did get the signal. So that's, that was the rationale, is actually starting with the data and then going to the simulation. Okay, thanks again to Shimon for this very nice presentation.